War of the Jews, the work by ancient historian Josephus, tells of the defeat of the Jews at Masada that happened in 74 AD and is dedicated to Vespasian, who died in 79 AD. So it must have been written somewhere in the mid-70s. In it, Josephus recounts the story of one Jesus ben Ananus, or ben Ananias, in Book 6, Chapter 5, Part 3. This is what he had to say. But what is still more terrible, there was one Jesus, the son of Ananus, a plebeian and a husbandman, who, four years before the war began, and at a time when the city was in very great peace and prosperity, came to the feast whereon it is our custom for everyone to make tabernacles to God in the temple, began on a sudden to cry aloud, A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, and a voice against this whole people. This was his cry as he went about by day and by night in all the lanes of the city. However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation at this dire cry of his, and took up the man and gave him a great number of severe stripes. Yet did not he either say a thing for himself or anything peculiar to those that chastised him, but still went on with the same words which he cried before. Hereupon our rulers, supposing, as the case proved to be, that this was a sort of divine fury in the man, brought him to the Roman procurator, where he was whipped till his bones were laid bare, yet he did not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, at every stroke of the whip his answer was, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! And when Albinus, for he was then our procurator, asked him who he was and whence he came, and why he uttered such words, he made no manner of reply to what he said, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty, till Albinus took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now during all the time that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was he seen by them while he said so, but he every day uttered these lamentable words, as if it were his premeditated vow, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! Nor did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food. But this was his only reply to all men, and indeed no other than a melancholy presage of what was to come. This cry of his was the loudest at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years and five months without growing hoarse or becoming tired therewith, until the very time that he saw his presage in earnest fulfilled in our siege, when it ceased, for as he was going around upon the wall he cried out with his utmost force, Woe, woe to the city again, and to the people, and to the holy house, and just as he added at the last, Woe, woe to myself also. There came a stone out of one of the engines and smote him and killed him immediately. And as he was uttering the very same presage, he gave up the ghost. So here Josephus is recounting something that he has heard or seen of the history of this Jesus Ananus. And we do find a lot of parallels with Mark's passion narrative. Is this a coincidence or do the two Jesuses have a common origin? The question turns on whether the association between the two stories is by chance or by cause, and that depends on how many and how close are the parallels, and how many trials we can make, which I'll come back to. The number of claimed parallels is large, but in a case like this, where we are trying to decide whether an association is by random chance or by causation, we need to be very strict about what a true parallel is, and how likely it is to arise by chance and not bend meanings to find parallels that aren't there. So the number of parallels that have been cited amounts to over 30, but I'm going to restrict them to those that are parallels with Mark's version, and those that I accept as being real. So the first parallel is that both were named Jesus. This is something that we can get quite a good statistical handle on, because we've got a good idea how common the name Jesus was. Around two of every 53 Jewish men were called Jesus at that time. There are four characters named Jesus in War of the Jews, one of whom was a general and son of a high priest, another was a high priest and a third was also a priest. So Ananus is the only non-priestly Jesus in War of the Jews. The second parallel is that both went to Jerusalem during religious festivals, but different festivals. Jesus and Anus went during the festival of tabernacles, whereas Christ went at Passover. 
Maybe not so surprising, as religious festivals were the reason most Jews went to Jerusalem. The third parallel is that both quote from Jeremiah chapter 7. This is a prophetic tirade against the backsliding people of Judea and their false religions, so a good source of material for preachers railing against Jerusalem. But it's odd that they should both come from this same chapter, as there are plenty of such chapters in the prophets. However, out of 229 chapters in the Old Testament, Jesus does quote around 95, depending on what you count, so about 10% of them. And the odds would shorten further if you restrict the analysis to prophetic diatribes attractive to railing preachers. The quote from Josephus is highlighted in red here and comes from Jeremiah 7 verse 34. I will bring an end to the sound of joy and gladness and to the voices of bride and bridegroom in the towns of Judea and the streets of Jerusalem, for the land will become desolate. In Jeremiah 7 verse 11 is this familiar phrase. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. That's quoted directly in Mark 11:17. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The fourth parallel, then, is that both predicted the temple's destruction, which is getting quite specific. Fifth is that both were apprehended by Jews, which isn't so surprising given their messages. The sixth parallel, neither spoke in their own defence at their hearings. And seventh, both were taken to the Roman governor, again neither speaking in their own defence. These two are getting more specific, making a coincidence more improbable. Finally, the eighth parallel, both were killed by Romans. But most people killed at this time were killed by Romans, and the mode of death could hardly be more different, crucifixion versus being hit by an artillery projectile. So that is a notable list of parallels. Now I'll return to the question of the number of trials. Trials is a term borrowed from statistics and probability, and it means the number of opportunities for parallels with Christ that we have. And that means the number of people whose accounts we have multiplied by the number of their deeds and sayings, and the number of deeds and sayings attributed to Christ. There's nothing special about these particular eight deeds and sayings of Jesus. Mark's Jesus did a lot of other things as well, often more significant like cursing a fig tree, restoring sight, calming storms, raising from the dead, forgiving sins, etc. So the more people we have accounts of, and the more they did and said, and the more Jesus did and said, the more likely it is that someone will have done or said one or more of the same things as Christ. Counting trials in this way means a lot of multiplying, and that means large numbers, and large numbers can give impressive lists of coincidences by chance. The counter to this argument is to appeal to even larger numbers, specifically the number of permutations of words and deeds. To illustrate this, consider the comparatively simple six-word phrase an east voice, a west voice. Googling that exact phrase makes no hits. And when you consider the vast size of the internet that Google is searching, that's perhaps quite surprising, but it's typical of short sentences like this, simply because the permutations of words, concepts and actions are so vast. That means that even with thousands of trials, finding a close conceptual or textual match is highly improbable by chance. If, and it is a big if, these eight parallels are not a coincidence, then there must be a causal link, and that does have implications. Of the three possible causal links, the one that Josephus was influenced by Mark seems highly improbable. That leaves two. Either Mark got it from Josephus, or they both got it from a common source. These two have similar implications, except that the common source idea implies that the story evolved in oral tradition, or at least out with Mark, and Mark was writing what he heard in good faith. In either event, a single death evolved into two very different death narratives. Crucifixion could have replaced the artillery narrative because Paul had been insisting on crucifixion for decades, so we can easily understand where it came from it's not easy to see how an original crucifixion narrative could have been replaced with Josephus' artillery version. 
I find it difficult to envisage the artillery version evolving into the crucifixion version in oral tradition, because it surely would have been obvious from the off that Josephus' version was different from Paul's. And further, Josephus' version was published in the mid-70s. Even if the story was circulating independently of Josephus, it occurred in the mid-60s, still a bit late to form part of the foundation of story of Christianity according to the historicity timeline. This leads me to the conclusion that if these eight parallels are not a coincidence, then it implies that Mark got it directly or via a short route from Josephus, which implies that whoever added these eight embellishments knew when they did so that they were borrowing narrative details from a human being who had not been crucified. This Jesus Ananus was not a god. He was not worshipped, so he can't have been folded into the Jesus tale by syncretism between religions the sort of thing that happens innocently in oral tradition. This syncretism seems to require something more cynical. And if Mark knowingly borrowed details from an ordinary human being, and a mad one at that, in order to create his Jesus character, it obviously undermines historicity. So if this is not a coincidence, it implies that the crucifixion of Jesus came from somewhere else, possibly Paul, possibly another historical character. But these other details came from a historical person who was not crucified. Though in truth these are just a few more details in a gospel that we already know contains much that's not historical. Anna News highlights the mechanism of death. The crucifixion is the most historicising part of the Jesus account because it is mentioned by the earliest independent sources and it is the one historical detail, or potential historical detail, that Paul repeatedly gives. So if we find that a historical Jesus was not crucified, then it strengthens the already strong silence of Paul argument in favour of mythicism, and it weakens the already weak extra-biblical historical record argument for historicity. And here we have a candidate for a prototype of a historical Jesus who was not crucified. So in the round, the argument from Jesus Ananus does appear to me to favour mythicism.